Hello and welcome everybody to the latest podcast of the UF Care Center at the University of Florida. My name is Oliver Grundman and it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Lance McMahon. Welcome Dr. McMahon and would you mind introducing yourself to our uh, audience? Absolutely, Dr. Grundman. Uh, Oliver, it's a pleasure to be uh, asked to participate in this podcast series, which I think is an excellent way for stakeholders uh, who are interested in drug abuse at the University of Florida and, and beyond to get an opportunity to see what the individual participants of the center are, are doing, get a, get a sense of their research. Um, so this is a great opportunity. I am a relatively recent hire at the University of Florida. I joined the university two and a half years ago uh, as the, uh, a professor and chair of the Department of Pharmacodynamics in the College of Pharmacy. I'm very much a preclinical pharmacologist, and uh, I told you what my position is now. I can back up in history and tell you that my primary degree is in a department of psychology where I was trained to become an experimental psychologist, uh, a student of B.F. Skinner, operant conditioning and the use of operant conditioning as a way to better understand drugs and their actions, and then also to use drugs to uh, help develop better preclinical models to predict drug effects in humans. And I've worked uh, throughout my career in a variety of, of animal species, a lot of the work that I have conducted has been in live animals, including mice, rats, pigeons, and rhesus monkeys. Currently at the University of Florida, the work that I do is primarily in, in mice and rats. And I have been funded continuously by the National Institute on Drug Abuse for uh, about 20 years now, not, uh, by the time my current uh, uh, slate of grants is, is complete. It'll be 20 years. And I've studied a variety of compounds. Um, I'm very broadly interested in drugs of abuse. I don't necessarily have a specific favorite. The choices I have made to focus on have been primarily driven by the topical, uh, the environment, what, what the government is interested in, what public and society is interested in, and those drugs have included benzodiazepines for anxiety treatment, opioids for pain treatment, cannabinoids, cannabis. In particular, I became very interested in chronic THC treatment and tolerance and dependence that has been reported in humans that are using very large amounts of, of marijuana developing preclinical models to address the dependence and withdrawal that is reported in that population. And most recently, I've come back to study opioids on a project related to kratom or mitragyna speciosa, which we can talk about later on in the podcast. And so that's basically my, my research history. I'm, I'm currently also teaching in the College of Pharmacy. I'm very happy to be here at the university. It's a very large uh, landscape. It is a terrific opportunity to engage uh, from a multidisciplinary uh, uh, perspective all the way from medicinal chemistry, which of course is your background and training, through epidemiology and public health science. And our charge uh, at the center as well as in some of the research projects that I'm participating on is to sort of bring all of those uh, areas together in a way to make drug abuse science at the University of Florida better. Um, you covered a, a lot of areas there when it comes to drug abuse in particular and how it relates translationally in particular when, when you talk about the preclinical stages when, when we look at animal models and how that translates into the clinical setting. How well do animal models represent the, the human behavior, uh, so especially when you refer to Skinner and Pavlov and, and you know, some of these, uh, these behavioral models. Um, so what got you initially interested in this field of drug abuse when you say you come from a, a psychological background? Uh, what got you then interested in drug abuse uh, from, from there on? 
There are multiple factors. I think the two that are most important for me is I've always been very curious and interested and engaged in human behavior. And to understand human behavior, what drives individuals to make certain choices. Um, we're constantly faced with making choices in our lives of how we want to spend our time, whether it be professionally or personally. Uh, there are certain drives that motivate us, the drive for food, the drive for water, the drive for sex to perpetuate the species, the drive for social uh, uh, relationships. And, and so generally speaking, I've been very fascinated by human behavior uh, in general. Now, what has led me to drug abuse in particular, I think I'm naturally, so I guess the second, I guess there's a two-part uh, uh, response to the, my second, uh, the factor that has driven me in this, in this area. One is personal experiences, not necessarily of myself, but uh, of family and friends. Uh, I think all of us have been touched to some extent by uh, drug abuse and its deleterious and sometimes devastating consequences on the individual relationships um, and, and certainly as from a societal impact drug abuse has has major negative consequences so from a personal perspective that that has interested me but I'm also driven by pharmacology uh, I'm, I'm just broadly interested in drug action and receptors and in particular how drugs interact with receptors in the brain, the central nervous system, and so that, that interface between behavior, drugs that alter behavior, and my interest in, in human behavior has sort of all come together to lead me down this path. But I, I would be disingenuous to not say that, you know, and this is sort of a philosophical point about how one's career progresses, you know, where I am now is and largely due to other factors in one's life about, uh, you know, relationships like, you know, so where I had worked to be close to who I'm married with now, opportunities, the, 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 the opportunity to be with great mentors. Um, you know, there's lots of other factors at play in, in having somebody wind up and where they are in their career at any given time. So, yeah. so there's multiple factors, but those are the main ones. Well, you also mentioned that as your career evolved, that you kind of chose um, topics or chose research areas that were important to the public. Um, and when you, when you talk, for example, about uh, nicotine or about opioids now at the moment, which is a big topic, and also the cannabinoids, if you think about it, the, the impact that we have when as legislation and recreational use are really on the rise in the United States. And um, you, you've um, uh, basically scored a, a, a very large um, uh, funding on uh, to that regard uh, with cannabinoid and cannabis research. Uh, and, and, and you mentioned nicotine research as well, and that's uh, again another example of where sometimes my my broad focus uh, uh, being promiscuous with respect to the kinds of drugs I'm interested in. I sometimes forget what I've studied over the years. So you're right, nicotine is is certainly part of my story. Yeah. So uh, when we when we come to to some of your current research projects, um, cannabis. Uh, you mentioned cannabis. You mentioned opioids, and particularly kratom. Um, and and with the kratom, we have a little bit of overlap. But uh, when we talk about a cannabis, lot of overlap, I would say <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. <laughs> uh, with the cannabis, um, can you describe that project and where you see? It impacting society and uh, not only in the state of Florida. It's, I understand it's it's a Florida-wide initiative, but how do you see that impacting your research, impacting uh, society as a whole, not not only in the state of Florida but nationwide and potentially globally? I think when we when we think about drugs of abuse or drug misuse, drug harm, how and people will call it uh, different things. Um, you have to think about the level of harm and disruption to the individual, the potential toxicity of an individual drug. And, you know, clearly there are drugs that are very problematic. Opioids, if you take too many, you stop breathing and you die. Uh, ethanol or alcohol, if you drink too much and, and you stop drinking abruptly, you can, you can go into delirious treatments and seizures, uh, and, and that can be potentially lethal. Um, you know, we think about the, the, the degree of harm that, that, 
drugs carry or the degree of risk. Cannabis, you know, is one of those sort of insidious, but also, uh, you know, uh, and I say insidious uh, from the perspective of heavy, chronic, long-term use. Um, and, and, you know, I, again, I have to, of course, be very careful. There are populations, certainly depending upon the situation. I, I think that a, a cancer patient who is suffering tremendously either from chemotherapy or other pain related to their disease, if they find relief from large dose cannabis use, uh, they would be hard pressed to characterize that as insidious. So whether you know, the drug use is, is having a positive influence on the individual or a negative in influence on the individual absolutely depends on the context and the, and the circumstances uh, are surrounding um, mm -hmm. that use. So let me, let me qualify uh, that right there. You know, cannabis is, is, there are lots of individuals who are able to use uh, cannabis either intermittently, and I would say even in some cases daily, um, and are able to function. You know, there are individual differences certainly in the way people respond to their, their drug consumption. But there, clearly, though, I think that in certain demographics and in certain situations, there are individuals, what I became interested in when I started that research was fairly heavy use. Um, I'm familiar and have, with the work and have collaborated with individuals at Columbia University, and they have a cohort of patients that they study who smoke what would be the equivalent of seven or eight joints a day. Now, you know, trying to estimate the dose these days is difficult because of the major differences in the THC content of, of different strains. And of course, we know it's not just tetrahydrocannabinol that's the only uh, cannabinoid that is being consumed when people use cannabis or, or marijuana. But there are certain individuals who, who are very heavy users, and clearly when they attempt to stop, they experience, maybe, you know, you could debate whether how clinically significant the withdrawal syndrome is, uh, but in a subset of individuals, it's, it's severe enough. It's characterized by anxiety, loss of uh, interest in food, decreased body weight, uh, disrupted sleep is a very critical uh, aspect of the marijuana or cannabis withdrawal syndrome in vivid dreams. Because while P individuals are using cannabis, their REM sleep episodes go down, and there's good research to show now that when they abruptly discontinue, those REM episodes rebound in a very significant way that leads them to have uh, very profound, sometimes uh, uh, disturbing dreams. All of that is thought to, to contribute to the difficulties associated with people discontinuing uh, cannabis use. And what I attempted to do in my research was to bring, and, and this is always the challenge when you are trying to model the human condition. The human condition is very unique. Uh, in non-human animals, I, I attempted to model marijuana or cannabis dependence and withdrawal in, in a procedure where animals received chronic long-term THC use or treatment. We would occasionally abruptly discontinue use. We would also administer a selective CB1 receptor antagonist, which turns off the actions of THC at its primary CNS site of action, thereby precipitating withdrawal. And we used a precipitated withdrawal procedure and a procedure called drug discrimination, which I, I won't uh, describe in any detail now for, for uh, interest of time. I've used drug discrimination, chronic treatment, and precipitated withdrawal procedures to better understand from a, from a preclinical perspective, the neurobiological substrates of cannabis withdrawal. The overall goal, of course, would be to, to try to uh, identify medications that could help those individuals uh, as they endeavor to uh, abstain from cannabis use. Okay. Well, given that we currently do not really have any medication or any clinical protocol in place to treat uh, cannabis withdrawal, no, there, there are some off-label uses of Marinol, which is the oral formulation of uh, THC. There are some off-label use, and, and that, of course, is used in pain uh, states, in particular wasting uh, conditions such as um, uh, advanced stages of AIDS or, or, or cancer. Um, uh, there's also Nabilone, which is a, THC, uh, a CB1 agonist that uh, is 
available, I believe, if not in the United States, certainly in some places in the world. And so there are uh, cannabinoid agonists that are used. Um, these are oral formulations. Uh, but you're right, there aren't any, uh, you know, FDA approved, for example, uh, medications for cannabis use disorder. Yeah. So uh, that seems to be a, a critical need, so to say, to, to address this as we see, obviously, recreational use um, on the rise and, and legislation being introduced for recreational use of marijuana without really any, any oversight in regards to regulation of THC content. And that seems to be what, what you are also pointing to, that there's no real oversight of how much THC is actually allowed in these recreational uh, marijuana products that are on the market, right? Right. And oh, by the way, not, you know, as you well know, Oliver, you know, the other cannabinoids, the other big one that comes to mind that seems to be in everybody's uh, you know, advertisements and in every product these days is cannabidiol. And there's, so that's just one example of the many tetrahydrocannabinols or cannabinoid compounds in uh, marijuana and cannabis that could potentially interact and, and work together to largely determine the overall uh, experience, the behavioral effects, the therapeutic effects, and the extent to which individuals are, are um, going to use the products uh, repeatedly or habitually. Oh, that's an interesting because everybody is marketing CBD as kind of this non-habitual, non-habit forming. And, um, and I think it's safe to say that by itself, CBD is a relatively inert, behaviorally active substance. Um, there is some, but I think what is, is a particular interest with respect to abuse liability is how CBD interacts with tetrahydrocannabinol, Delta-9, which, which is thought to be the, the driver of um, abuse and dependence, how CBD may either enhance that or inhibit that or, or have no effect on that. And th that, that is information that's yet to be definitively um, you know, determined. Hmm. What role CBD plays, or any of the other cannabinoids play for that matter in, in uh, repeated can cannabis use. Yeah, well, given that we have like, I don't know, uh, 40 that have been definitely identified and we have over 100 or so that remain kind of structurally maybe identified, but not really their, their pharmacology very well defined. So I guess right. there's work to be done. There is work to be done. Yes, it's very exciting. <laughs> So let's uh, let's switch gears for just a second on on quatum because I don't I don't want to keep you too long but uh, I think it's the, it's an interesting topic because it's kind of come to to the conscience of um, of the, the of the press and of the public as well uh, and I know that you're working uh, very closely with um, Dr McCurdy together on this and uh, we had him on a former podcast uh, so it, it, I think this is a good kind of a collaboration and it, it highlights kind of uh, some of the aspects of uh, what we can do within U of care uh, and hopefully there will be more collaborations beyond the College of Pharmacy uh, where we have opportunities to collaborate um, within UF uh, where the pharmacology aspects and the medicinal chemistry aspects kind of work together really uh, to uh, elucidate more of the um, of, of establish more science that is really needed when it comes to emerging uh, new psychoactive substances. And I guess Quatom is one of these currently new psychoactive substances that is emerging where we don't really, where we have some discrepant information that is circulating. Um, how would you characterize your aspect that you are now contributing to the science on Quatom? So that, um, this gives me an opportunity not only to talk about the science of Kratom, but I, I'll try to remind myself uh, to speak a little bit about the collaborative opportunities. I'll just say quickly that I think Dr. McCurdy's and my collaboration in this regard is an excellent example of collaborative synergy. Uh, there's, he and I are in uh, strong agreement that this project would not have been possible with either of us as individuals. And certainly it was only when we came together and identified um, our, our overlapping but yet distinct expertise that it was possible to 
to obtain very substantial uh, uh, funding, including a, a grant from the, the HEAL initiative, the so-called Helping to End Addiction Long-Term uh, uh, pot of money that has been identified as a, as a way to curtail the opioid crisis. Uh, you know, Kratom, and I was just at Temple University yesterday at their Center for Substance Abuse Research giving a, a seminar on this topic, and, and, and it was well attended. It, it generated some of the most enthusiastic Q&A that I've, I've seen in, in some time. So while I'd like to take credit for that, I, I think it's the topic <laughs> that is, is driving the enthusiasm and not necessarily the person delivering the message. Um, you, you know and I know, we're, we're well aware that there are uh, – individuals in this country and around the world who are, are convinced, committed, adamantly in support of the value of, of Kratom, whether it's taken uh, in capsule form uh, or as the consumed as a, a, a boiled concoction as tea, people who have PTSD, people who have pain, people who are, are dependent on other opioids such as heroin or prescription opioids or fentanyls or you name it, that say that Kratom has saved their lives. Um, and so that it's, it's, uh, at first when you hear uh, reports from the public, you wonder, okay, you know, to what extent is this hype? To what extent is this, is this um, uh, going to be empirically validated and supported by data? But the, the longer you stay in this area, the, the more I think you and I are convinced that there's absolutely something there. There is some therapeutic benefit to this plant. Um, so that's, I think, the first point to be made is that there are, are uh, a large population of individuals taking the product who, who clearly indicate that there's some value. You know, I, I think we're, we're rapidly gathering data, our group in particular, but I think that, that, you know, other scientists are becoming more engaged in this area. We're... The, one of the first things to bear in mind is it's a plant that's a mixture of different alkaloids. And we often talk about mitragynin or, or 7 hydroxy mitragynin, painanthine, uh, speciosiliotine, the, the individual alkaloids that are contained in the plant. I think we have a long way to go. I mean, let's go back to the cannabis analogy. We've been studying that plant for 40 or 50 years, and we're still trying to figure out what the pharmacology is of the natural product when all of those ingredients are put together and consumed at the same time. As pharmacologists, we try to t t take each individual component apart and, and study it very carefully. And that's important, but it's only by then putting it back together in the natural mixture can you truly understand uh, what's happening when people are taking the leaf material. So we have a long way to go, but mitragynin is the one that we're, we're focusing on now. It seems to have some uh, analgesic effects. Uh, it, it doesn't seem to have uh, uh, reinforcing effects. So in the standard self-administration procedure where you train an animal to press a lever to activate an infusion pump to deliver a dose of drug to the animal, um, animals will not press that lever, uh, at least in the few studies that have been published, to obtain an infusion of mitragynin. So, but there are certainly indications in, in, and you know this from your extensive work in, in the human uh, reports that there are some positive reinforcing, potentially euphoric qualities to the, uh, that drug experience. We are also, you know, we're very, so there's the abuse, there's the potential uh, analgesic properties, but of course we're also talk toxicologists or at least safety pharmacologists and we want to understand, does this compound decrease respiration the same way that say fentanyl or heroin does, which clearly uh, is an issue with the, the news reports you see people dying all the time from overdosing on, on opioids, they stop breathing. You know, it looks like Kratom may have less liability in that regard. Um, and it has, the other, I think, important point to point out or to make is that it's not simply an opioid. Not just mitragynin, which is the primary alkaloid. By primary, we mean that's the most abundant alkaloid uh, in the plant. There are others. Um, but, that, but mitragynin and all of the other alkaloids we're, we're coming to find have non-opioid pharmacology. They act on monoaminergic receptors, uh, so it's this complex, rich pharmacology that I, I think not only makes it potentially a safer, 
and, and you could maybe argue more effective medication because of its safety. Um, but I think it also opens the, the p potential for using the plant to treat a variety of disorders that may engage those different transmitter systems. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that it's safe and that people should go out and, and, and take Kratom. I mean, you and I know that, that um, you know, anytime you have a potential uh, uh, drug of abuse or, or, or habit-forming drug, if you will, if you allow me to say that, there are going to be complications. So I think consumers and, and the scientific uh, uh, you know, scientists and, and the lay public need to be very careful as the information is being collected on this plant so that they can make informed decisions about whether it's an appropriate substance uh, to use as an opioid dependence treatment or for pain or PTSD or whatever. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. Uh, uh, I think that, as you said, we, we're still have to collect data and, and I think we have to kind of catch up where the human experience uh, is currently at. Where Humans we, are far uh, ahead of our the preclinical and the basic <laughs> scientists, absolutely, and they usually are. <laughs> <laughs> the good old trial and error kind of approach as a human, right? You, right. you, you kind of try something and you see what, what it does to you and then uh, uh, you kind of go back to the drawing board and, and you look at, okay, this is, this is the reports that we get. Now, what does the science tell us afterwards um, in regards to receptor activities and how can we link that back to the reports from humans? So um, I think that this collaboration that you have established uh, hopefully can also be expanded up on uh, uh, with other uh, youth care members um, to, to really translate that then because what is really lacking at the moment is a, a good clinical study uh, at the moment. Couldn't agree um, more. That, Couldn't agree that, more. There's certainly yeah. huge need to do carefully controlled uh, human trials to address questions that are just really not always easy if, and sometimes impossible to address in non-human studies. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess we can both uh, write our wish list for next Christmas and um, wait what what Santa is going to bring. So that's, right. that's something uh, to look out for. So um, I, I want to conclude uh, by asking you, in, in your opinion, as both kind of seeing the preclinical pharmacology, but also obviously as somebody who is working in that space, being very much aware of how your work then translates into the clinical setting, because that's what you are what your work is trying to accomplish in the end. Uh, where, where do you see the biggest challenges uh, moving forward with substance use disorder treatments and what the, uh, what the scientific community and society at large are facing at the moment? There's a, there's a few different general ways I could answer that question. And, and, and some of my response is related to my fascination of joining a college of pharmacy most recently after having worked in a medical school for many years. The idea that, that you know, natural products are, are important therapeutics that don't always lend themselves easily to study and regulation in the way that the FDA would like and other regulatory agencies. They like to simplify things. They like single compounds or, or maybe a couple of compounds in very specified proportions well, you know, with well-known characterized uh, information about their, their pharmacology and overall effects. So I think the interplay between you know, humans are attracted, and, and we all have been, right, for hundreds of thousands of years of our existence, we've been eating plants. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's food, sometimes it's medicine, and sometimes that, that boundary between food and medicine is, is blurred. Um, and, and so I think as we go back to cannabis, as we go back to nicotine, I mean, a lot of the, 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 the products and many drugs of abuse, for that matter, are ultimately have you know, natural products as their origin is to come up with, this is a huge challenge, is to, to regulate uh, and protect consumers, uh, but also not take away their access to tried and true natural products which are safe and which have clear uh, health benefits to them. 
We're seeing this with cannabis. Um, but, you know, the, the, again, as we make cannabis more available to the consumer, the question then becomes, how are we going to regulate this? Because, you know, you can't tame Mother Nature. Mother Nature, I mean, you can try to control grow conditions, right? Uh, the soils, the lights, the, the, the nutrients, but ultimately the plant is going to be what it is and probably different from a, a brother or a sister plant. So to get consistency across product is going to be very challenging to uh, regulation. So I think that's, that's an area, you know, th again, the, I think the FDA would prefer to um, isolate a single compound and, and have that approved for human use. But I, I think the fact that plants are, are used by humans and have therapeutic benefit illustrates the importance of polypharmacology. And whether we like it or not, polypharmacology has value. And just because we can't control it and understand it doesn't mean that we should take it off the table for uh, uh, human benefit. So that, that's one area. And just, uh, I was speaking with students yesterday at this visit at Temple University, postdocs and, and graduate students. The other thing I would add is I would encourage all addiction scientists, regardless of, of where you are uh, in epidemiology, public health, all the way down to preclinical and medicinal chemistry, to become better versed uh, and, and equipped to discuss these issues, uh, issues of um, you know, drug safety policy that, that informs regulation and potential scheduling and, and legal actions on, on drugs. I was watching uh, uh, one of the news channels the other day and they had a panel of reporters who were not scientists and, and they, they were, it just came across as being very ignorant. Some of the things they were saying about decriminalization and or legalization of drugs. It's very important that we, you know, we like to study our, our niche, but I think we need to become uh, uh, more uh, broad and have a, a larger perspective on the science, on, on policy, because if we don't help inform uh, public policy and how, how um, drugs are treated from both a societal and legal perspective, it's going to fall into the hands of people who are ill-equipped and are going to make that, I and mean, we see that. If you leave it to politicians, so, you know, so as scientists, it's important for us to become engaged in the process and try to impact uh, policy and decision making uh, so that the best outcome uh, is achieved for, for the consumer. We still are the experts. Uh, and uh, yeah, we should be involved in that discussion. I, I completely agree. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Dr. McMahon, uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today. And I think this is this was an awesome discussion. Um, I, I enjoyed, hope it. You enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <I enjoyed>. It's <laughs> always a pleasure speaking with you, Oliver. And, and no matter the context, but this one was particularly uh, pleasant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really look forward uh, to uh, more research coming out of your lab, out of your collaborations. I think this is very impactful work and it's very relevant work and it highlights again how preclinical pharmacology really leads into and relates to and translates into um, policy, into the clinical setting and helps us as, uh, as a society uh, to, uh, to apply basically uh, what we uh, to move forward on um, on drugs uh, on on substance use disorders and implement what we can learn from science, how science impacts us. So I think it's it's very important to not forget about what is done in these preclinical settings and how this reflects impacts um, the big picture. Yeah, impacts the big picture exactly. You for sure. That. Awesome. So thank you very much for taking the time today. Thank you, everybody, for listening uh, and look forward to the next US, uh, UF uh, Care podcast. Thank you, Likewise. everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>